So welcome everyone to our kickoff event for our Composing Wellness program for this academic year. We're happy to have you here. We would be even more happy if after this event, which is going to wow you, if you go and tell all your friends and make sure they come to all the other events, right? It's okay. So um, this is our, our first of several different events. So I wanted to show you, do a little advertising for some of the upcoming events. So we'll see here Thursday, September 24, we have uh, a lecture about your, your smartphone, your servant or your master. And then on October 5th, we'll have the, uh, the beautiful play called Beautiful. Then on Tuesday, uh, October 6th, that's the Flame Fist and Dance Tour. And uh, the 14th is, uh, oh, that's mine. <laughs> Envisioning the creative process of a mindful and physical well-being. And then, uh, uh, that's a lecture that I'm giving. And then Thursday, the 22nd, we have some emergency preparedness training. There are some other events coming up in November and some that are going to be next semester as well. So please do keep your eyes open for that and be prepared for some really interesting and hopefully very thoughtful and helpful interactive programming. So to start with, to get us started with our discussion today. So the theme today was composing wellness. So I was talking to some of my students about this concept, composing wellness, and a lot of my students were asking this question, what does wellness actually mean? And so that was one of the questions I asked you on your, your handouts here, one of your kind of pre-event questions, what does wellness actually mean? So I looked it up on, online, and here's the answer. So it's a pretty simple definition, right? All makes sense? Oh, actually, my favorite part right here is when it says napping. That's my favorite part, actually. But as we can see, wellness is a very nebulous term. If you will look it up in a dictionary, it'll give you a really quick definition. Physical and mental well-being is what the actual answer would be. But there's obviously more to it than that. And there's lots of different ways to think about wellness, to approach wellness. Today, I'm not here to really talk about wellness in terms of eating right or exercise. Those are important things. But I'm speaking more at a conceptual level. I'm thinking about wellness, especially in relationship to our community, to our school, to each other, to our friends and family, this sort of thing. So how do we, confine, how do we define composition? That's a complicated term also. So when I talk about composing wellness, what am I talking about here? So one does not simply define composition. We hear the term all the time, of course, so here's the cliche of composition. We see the composition textbook or the composition notebook in this case. And uh, this is what we expect to go to class and to learn in English class all about composition. But the word is actually very versatile. It means lots of different things. To compose is to create to take elements that exist and create an artistic and unique new creation. Composition is a term used in lots of different fields. Pretty much any field you can imagine has the concept of design built into it. I'm sorry, not the concept of design, but also design. Has the concept of composition built into it. And so here we do see design. Composition is obviously an extremely important part of that field. In photography, the word composition is used a lot, talking about how you're framing your photographs. Also in architecture, in dance and performance, in theater, culinary art. That looks too good to eat. I don't know what you guys think, but. Even mathematics and science, even though it is said in a, uh, you know, composition can be an artistic moment. There's nothing that says that there has to be a demarcation between science and math and art. All of these ideas are interrelated, and all of them are interested in the concept of composing. We're creating new ideas. So composition is a process. It's not just a one-time event. It's not just something you sit and do. It is a process. It is a skill that we can learn to improve over time. As I'm showing you here, here's this piece of fine art, but it's not just randomly laid out. The artist who created this didn't just say, oh, it looks good here, it looks good here, blah, blah, blah. This is, again, a, definition, a demonstration of how mathematics works its way into composition and into art. Composition is a creative process in defining and articulating oneself. Composition is a creative process in defining and articulating oneself. So when we're talking about composing wellness, wellness itself is also a process. 
It's a set of decisions that we make, choices that we make to improve our overall wellness. Health is part of it. Health, yes, eating well and exercising, but also our mental health, the health of our communities, the health of our campus. Our campus is also a composition. Our campus is composed of physical spaces, like this lecture room, like the walkways, like the fountains and the parking lots. These are all compositions, and they're there for functional purposes, but they're also there for conceptual purposes, to give us room to grow and express and articulate ourselves. But it's not the whole composition. It's not quite the whole composition. There's something missing to call this a whole composition if we talk about the campus. What do you guys think? What may be missing here? People. Good answer, yes. Our campus is also a community. And that community contributes, and I would argue is the most important part of the composition of our, of our, not just this classroom, but of our entire campus. We see our students in classrooms, in athletics, the EDEM program. And so our campus is a community. So in this case, I'm talking about composing wellness. Composing wellness in this case, for this presentation, we're thinking about this concept of composing a well campus means composing a well community. So how do we compose a well community? How do we create a well campus? If the definition of community, if the operational understanding of a community is communication, interaction between people, this is what we focus on. How do we interact with one another? How can we improve our community by improving our interactions with one another? What can you compose? And how can you contribute to the wellness of your community? You're part of it. You can contribute in a positive way. You can contribute in a negative way. Or you can choose not to contribute. It's all your choice. But I'm suggesting if we choose to contribute in a positive way, let's spend some time thinking about that. And then at the end of the, uh, the lecture, you'll notice on the handouts, everybody has an index card. And so at the very end, there's a couple of questions at the bottom of the program that I'm asking you to fill out. And one of those questions is, how can you contribute to the wellness of this community? So I want you to spend some time thinking about that as we're going through the other speakers today. And really put some thought into it. Then you'll turn those cards in as you're leaving, and we can all contribute from this conversation. So what I would like us to do now uh, is something a little out of the ordinary, something a little unusual, but I want to shake things up a little bit. I want us to be a community and not just sitting either by ourselves or with people who we already know that we're comfortable with. So we're going to do a little activity I call a shuffle. All right, so what we're going to do, I invite everyone, you're not required to, of course, but I do invite everyone to stand up, please. Well, except uh, the speaker is obviously this part doesn't count, but um, <laughs> if everyone can please move your seat to somewhere else and sit with someone who you don't know, please sit with someone who you don't know. So move seats, find someone to sit with who you don't know. Introduce yourself to that person. Say hello, shake hands. We're building a community here. You can sit with three people, that's okay. <laughs> it doesn't have to be pairs. But I'm asking us to grow our community. I'm asking us to meet new people. If this doesn't feel a little uncomfortable, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> okay. It's good. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
So that's our first activity. We have some other activities after some of the other speakers. I really don't want to do a presentation where all of us just sit and talk at you guys for an hour and a half, because you're just going to go to sleep, and that's not going to advance our goals here. So from time to time, we're going to shake things up a little bit. Um, after Professor Morgan speaks, I'm going to then uh, uh, have another activity for us. I'll jump back up real quick and uh, we'll jump into something. And certainly towards the end, there's going to be a Q&A session. So you might spend a little bit of time thinking about what kinds of questions you might ask of your presenters. And uh, we'll, we'll spend some time discussing towards the end of the presentation today. So right now, I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker. So uh, Professor Morgan, um, who is going to speak to us about object relationship theory. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, transition objects, and this is borrowed from uh, psychologist D.H. Winnicott. Um, the big essay for transition objects was, I think, in like 1953, so this is a bit old. Um, I'm, and I say borrowed from D.H. Winnicott because I make a couple of modifications, but I don't think there are any egregious modifications. So um, the, the start of this is kind of one of the hip things in um, birthing classes right now is talk about the fourth trimester. The fourth trimester is, so you have you know, three trimesters in the womb, the fourth trimester out of the womb, and that fourth trimester, you might as well consider the baby still in the womb. Whatever baby wants, baby gets. And so the big four milk diapers being held in sleep. So here's the fourth trimester in, the, in a nutshell. Every, every need is met by the good enough guardian. Now Winnicott says the good enough mother, but Winnicott's clear to say it doesn't have to be the, the literal mother. And so I just say, ah, it's easy enough to call it good enough guardian. The baby at this point does not differentiate between mother and baby. And so a nice quote about this is there's no such thing as the baby. There's a nursing mother baby couple. Um, so the need, say baby's hungry, the object of satisfaction would be milk, and the satisfaction fullness are all part of emerged experience. From the baby's perspective, there's no um, differentiation. It just happens. And again, whatever the baby wants is all there is. So the good enough guardian's function is to actively adapt to the baby's every need. The guardian is experienced by the baby as part of the baby. Um, in the same way my hand is experienced as part of me, the good enough guardian is experienced as part of the baby. Um, this is still Winnicott. But at some point, the party's over, and um, a period of separation needs to happen. So uh, the good enough guardian will begin this process of separation by recognizing that some needs can withstand disappointment. For instance, the baby can sit in the crib a little bit longer than um, initially wanted, or the baby can kind of do something on her or his own. Um, the good enough guardian in, in the key issue is does not adapt to the baby's every need. And this is a world shattering experience for the baby. So the baby's starting to recognize that the world might not exist for the, solely for the um, gratification of the baby. And it's beginning to see that there's an internal world of you know, my wants, needs, desires, and an external world that may or may not uh, fulfill those wants, needs, and desires. Which brings us to Winnicott's big theory of the transition object. So the transition object is when the good enough guardian slowly brings the baby from illusionment, so everything I need is magically taken care of by that good enough guardian, to disillusionment, some needs are not gonna be taken care of, and basically the baby's like, I want my old life back. The baby's sense of the world is challenged through this disillusionment. Uh, the transition object bridges the uh, worlds between the internal, um, the you know, whatever I'm feeling on the inside, and the external world that is not meeting those needs. Uh, the object is tra uh, chosen by the baby, it's fully available for the baby, and it's subject to whatever the baby inflicts upon it, and at the same time, it's external to the baby. The blanket is a, is a real common transition object. Whatever the baby does to it, the blanket just is there for the baby. Um, and then finally, uh, the transition object, it, it softens the blow of the newly recognized external world that does not exist to satisfy the baby's uh, every desire. So I'm going to play fast and loose with Winnicott. So there's my footloose slide. But to be sure, every generation is covered on this. I'm going to play fast and loose with Winnicott. And there's my footloose slide. Um, OK, so rethinking transition objects, an excuse to talk about my kids. So what happened was uh, my seven, now 18-month-old son, my now 18-month-old son, he went through the transition object experience with a blankie. 
But then when we started going to sending him to daycare, he locked onto this teddy bear with a death grip, and it stayed with him at all times. And so he already went through a formal transition object period, and the confusing thing is that this popped up as a new transition object to me, and I was trying to make sense of why that's happening. And that led me to kind of rearticulate the way the transition object functions. So what you have going on then to go re-go through Winnicott and, and kind of describe the function of a transition object in a different way, you have an environmental shift is experienced. So for the baby, the environmental shift was when the good enough guardian no longer accommodated the baby's every need. The environmental shift that happened with my son was he was consistently in a place that he knew very well. He was in the home environment. He had one parent with him at all times. Another parent would come and go. Um, and he knew that well, that, air, that um, environment very well. And then there's a shift from stability to instability. The baby used to experience the world as providing for baby's every need. This no longer happens, so the world becomes unstable, unpredictable, and scary. And for my son, that shift was going from home to this daycare center where it's a whole bunch of new people, different schedules, and now both parents are coming and going into the life at different times. So the transition object then functions as a bridge between the previously stable environment and the new unfamiliar and unstable environment. It comes from or reminds what's one of the stable environment but can be brought into the unstable environment. So he brings that bear from the stable home into this unstable daycare back to home. Um, and so that's that transition uh, object. It serves as a stable touch point as one learns to navigate the unstable, unfamiliar environment. And often it has a significance specific to the individual and the final point, though, is transition objects are not just for children. Case study, a chance to talk about a friend. So at my last job, um, I had an office mate. We were really close. Uh, I come to this job, and all of a sudden I notice three months into it, I have this stack of pencils on my desk, that stack of pencils, that I never use. And I was like, why do I have these here? And then it clicked. Oh, wait. My friend at my last job had a stack of pencils on his desk all the time, at the beginning of every semester, and at the end of the semester, that stack of pencils was empty. And I started saying, oh, wait a minute. This stack of pencils is functioning for me as a transition object to help me from my previously stable environment to a new job that's now an unstable, uncertain environment, and that helps make the transition. Another example for me was um, that last job. Uh, a few months into it, I took up cycling pretty avidly, and um, one day it clicked, wait a minute, my dissertation advisor is an avid cyclist. I think this is functioning as a transition object for me. So all that to say transition objects can function for adults as well. Now, talking about college in particular, but first, the big three life stressors, you have death, moving, and divorce. And what those are is the death would be the loss of a loved one, and there's a destabilizing move there. Moving, the loss of a home environment, there's destabilizing there. And divorce, the loss of a family structure is destabilizing there. Talking about college, College students typically experience moving either to a new town or a new home, house or dorm room or to a new campus. So there's the moving one. And then a good amount of uh, students also experience divorce here. I'd like to thank Sally Ponce O'Rourke for bringing this insight to me. A lot of well-intending parents wait until the child is out of the home. In other words, they wait till the child goes to college and to get divorced. And so now the students are encountering adult, two of the big three stressors at the same time, moving and divorce. Um, so students are often bombarded with destabling events in an already chaotic time. And that brings me to a question. I was hoping there'd be a ton more students in the room because that question would have been directed to the students. But there's, if there's any students who are willing to answer this, um, I don't think we're having a big enough sample group. The first question was, do any of you have a, uh, currently, after thinking about this, say, yeah, I have a transition object. The second question would be, how much would you say uh, the transition object commit, uh, contributes to your emotional wellness? And the third question, which for me is a big question, I'm really curious about this, and this ties in with um, Brian's theme of con uh, composing wellness, is can, can transition objects be intentionally created? In other words, can they be composed? Can I make a transition object that will help me negotiate the move from a stable to an unstable environment? Or do you just have to discover them? Are they things that are they're just there? And the, the attempt to compose one is a failed attempt. And that's the, the big question that I'd really like to ask um, so at the end, if we have time, there it is, and handing off. Okay, so I'm going to leave this up just for a moment if you guys want to write down any of those questions and, and take note of that, and so we can bring those back up during the, the Q&A at the end to ask this question about transition objects. Do you have one? 
Do they contribute to your emotional wellness? And this concept of can we create one? And I'm also very interested in this idea of creation, of creating a community and recognizing a community. One thing I didn't mention in my initial presentation that I, I meant to mention, a big part of our community I mentioned was the people, and I pointed out the students. But I also wanted to point out the other people in the community as well of this particular college campus. We have, of course, our faculty. We have, of course, our staff members. We have people in uh, the counseling office, the transfer office, the uh, maintenance division. We have the administration. We have the health services. So keep in mind that this is a community. This is a community that offers resources to you. We're all sort of linked by a single goal, which is success for our students. And you can help to contribute that, both by being successful yourselves, but also thinking how can you contribute to the success of your community as a whole. Okay, thank you very much, um, Professor Morgan. And then, so this next activity, if you look at your handout here, the, the IOU, that stands for, uh, what did you find interesting and or useful? So that's my question right here, is to ask you to please take a few moments to reflect on what you have found interesting and or useful about the event so far. So I gave you some space to write in an answer if you, if you choose. And so we're not quite halfway through, but we're, we're into it. We've had some lecture. You guys have been sitting for a while. So let me invite, if anybody would like to share something, an idea you're having right now about something interesting or useful about what we're talking about so far, whether it's concept of community or transitional objects, composition of transitional objects. Yeah? You can get a mic. Well, you can wait till one moment. You can get you a mic so you can get on the uh, on the recording. It's okay. It's on the way. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'm finding a multitude of interesting things. Um, one is the idea of the the community and the reminder of community being part of communication and that aspect of of health, uh, being able to communicate, being able to express emotions when important and uh, the other thing that I really found interesting was the presentation just made of um, the the object and the the infant and the parent and the and the one and not just looking into that as uh, a student relationship but in adult relationships where there seems to be sometimes conflict and uh, people who are, are frightened by change and don't adapt to that well. So not just limiting that to looking at the student relationship coming into college, but I'm seeing that you know amongst peers and, uh, and adults and their interactions with each other. And that's insightful to look at that and also what potentially might transition objects be for people in those situations to better understand the transitions they're going through. Thank you for that. That's great. Can you think of like a, a can you think of a specific one as you're saying you're thinking of adults in the way that they get into these I, objects? I am. <laughs> I'm dealing with with conflict. I I'm a coach and uh, I have uh, an athlete that is uh, struggling very much with adapting to change and disrupting the team community. Oh. And I'm struggling as a coach how to better manage that situation so uh, everyone can coexist in peace and harmony. <laughs> So that's great. You did actually a really good job of, of connecting this idea of, of community and communication, but also with this idea of object and object theory and the ways that we can think about that as a, as a coping mechanism for these, these really harsh transitions in lives. That's really good. Thank you for, for your insight. Did anybody else want to share something that they found interesting or useful so far? Yes, over here, please. Tell us. Next one up. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when you were asking, uh, you know, how do we create community and communication? I was thinking harmonious communication is what we desire to create better community and wellness in the community. Okay. And you asked then, how do we contribute to that? So I was, I was reflecting on, on my semester in the classroom I, I teach. And uh, my challenge this semester is, is having two uh, autistic uh, students who mm -hmm. are very verbal. And, uh, and I thought, okay, so I have to model, I have to modulate and uh, mentor so that the student-to-student -student relationship is acceptance and, and uh, meeting the needs of, of those students and all the others and, and trying to keep a, 
a challenging balance also with myself on, on sometimes, you know, the unexpected that comes in the classroom. So I guess that was my reflection on, on, uh, on what you were talking about. And then thinking about transitionals is like, I think my whole house is transitional <laughs> objects. <laughs> just whole from moving house. to another country, I brought a lot of stuff with me just to <laughs> make the transition. Thank you. <laughs> well, they say, you know, the, the Hearst Castle is actually a European castle that you brought over brick by brick, so you could have done that, I suppose. I kind of did. I All come right, from Europe, <laughs> so I guess it's a habit. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a really good example, thinking about our concept of community and how sometimes there are elements of our community that we're not mm, skilled with, that we're not familiar with, and so they can represent certain challenges. So then I guess our challenge is to think of how to make that into an opportunity, how to grow our community, and how to be more accepting and more welcoming, and that way help ourselves to grow, but also for the individuals that we're thinking about. You know, of course, and, and for the rest of the students too, I want you guys to know about, of course, we have the access office here on campus, and, and they're, they're full of resources to help with this, you know, kind of situation and strategies and um, both help for the students and for faculty. So that's an example of our community working together in the different departments and how we all kind of come together. And again, we all have that same goal. We want your students to be successful, both those particular students you were speaking of, but of course, as you mentioned, your entire class as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. And Very I thought good. it had to start with me. Yes, the well, and starting with yourself. With me and, then, and, then, and then mentoring that across the world. Yes, you're right. And, and thinking of oneself as part of the community is extremely important. Yes, well, that, and that's the way to keep asking that question. Where are you in this community? How can you contribute? Yeah, that's always the first question. Very good. Thank you. Um, okay, so I would like now to uh, switch over to our next speaker, uh, President Sanchez, who is going to talk to us about some of the, the challenges involved in, uh, at, in wellness. So, uh, so first of all, I want to thank Professor Morgan for the uh, clever caption for this, which is, when wellness hits the fan. Uh, it's, it's slightly uh, misleading as a title in terms of what, the, what my interest is, but, um, but, it's a, it's an, but it's a clever uh, caption, and it's, uh, it, it kind of represents sort of the end game uh, about this. And we know what we mean by when wellness hits the fan. We know when wellness has gone awry, if it's physical wellness, uh, and it's gone awry, then it usually results in harm to ourselves or to the, to the subject. Um, if it's uh, emotional wellness, it re results in harm to ourselves or to other people. Um, if it's financial wellness, typically harm to ourselves, maybe to other people because we're not paying our bills. Um, so, so we know that the, the end game of not paying attention to wellness is not a good thing. My, my particular interest has to do with organizational wellness and, of course, that's kind of my job to, to pay attention to how, how is our organization, how is our college tending to the wellness of our students and our employees. Um, and um, the, uh, for, first of all, I, I'd like to express my uh, appreciation to the college community for choosing wellness as the theme this year. We've gone through a difficult period of time the last several years. Um, all of us have, fa have experienced the effects of the, the deep recession, uh, the toll it took upon uh, employee morale, the cutting of classes, the cutting of services, the cutting of staff, and, and that has a profound effect upon our well, our well being. None of us got into the business of education because we wanted to curtail services for students. All of us are here because we, we get uh, deep gratification and pleasure uh, out of being able to help students along the way. And I don't think you can actually quantify the toll that it took on all of us, but I think every single person who's lived through it can tell you uh, some stories about, uh, about it. And because of that, and because we're trying to come out of the, uh, uh, the effects of all of that, uh, it's, it's a good year for us to pay attention to healing uh, ourselves, our students, and the institution as well. Um, the components, uh, at least that, um, and when I talk about organizational wellness, I actually kind of, I, I'm, what I mean is, how, how do we fulfill our mission optimally? How can we perform in a way that optimally fulfills that mission? And here are some of the components that I think um, that in, entails. Um, and the first one is to, to being careful with our resources uh, when the economy changes, as it has, thank goodness, the economy started to pick up some steam uh, and our revenues are starting to climb back up. 
there's, a, there's so much pent up demand for those, re for those resources that it would be really easy to go overboard in the, uh, in the use of those resources and find ourselves in worse trouble in, in a year or two. Uh, so part of it is, is being careful with our resources. Um, I used to, when I used to practice law, I remember uh, representing a family that had won the lottery and they'd won something like $70 million, and this was a family that had been mostly destitute prior to that time. And, and against my counsel uh, and against the counsel of their financial advisors, they did what so many people do when they, when they run into uh, a lot of money. They ended up squandering it uh, too fast, and there were all kinds of charlatans that came out of the woodwork to try to tap into their resources. So part of it is, is, keeping, uh, is being careful with our resources. Part of it is staffing appropriately. What people do we need and what places in order to do our jobs best uh, and trying to place the right people in those positions. Uh, part of it is hiring good people and then nurturing their development. And part of nurturing their development has to do with professional development and making sure that everyone has an opportunity to learn and grow in the fields that they're interested in. Uh, part of it is paying attention to employee morale and that uh, everybody at the end of the day has a home that they go to, uh, hopefully, uh, and a family that they support. And so part of our obligation is to make sure that our employees feel well tended and actually are well tended. And I know sometimes that's easier said than done, but it doesn't make it any less important. Um, part of it is, is making sure that we're analyzing data. You can carry this idea too far, but um, it, it's important that we not just settle for platitudes, that not just settle for the idea that we're doing the best we can, but take a look at how we're doing uh, in, in any ways that really are measurable, measurable and uh, relevant to the job that we do, so that we're not simply um, proclaiming ourselves fourth in the nation, so that, it's, so that it, it actually means something that's supported by the data, and looking at data that tells us that here's some areas where we could uh, do better. Um, part of it is, uh, is focusing on continuously improving, uh, and I think that's an inherent uh, and important part of wellness generally, the idea that every day I want to do this a little bit better than I did yesterday, and then we, sl we slip, we fall back a little bit, we, we dust ourselves off, pick ourselves up, and go back into the ring and try harder the next time. There's something about that resilience of the human spirit, that thing we sometimes call grit, that I think is fundamental to wellness in it, and it applies at the organizational level as well. That's, that's the collective sense of all of us, uh, having the, the motivation, the desire, the determination to do better uh, constantly. Uh, part of it is, is walking the talk, and that's, um, I have a, a, an enormous responsibility there, and that is I know that if I want uh, my colleagues to be respectful, to be transparent, uh, to be um, relentlessly dedicated to their position, then I have to be all of those things. Because if, if I'm not, the model that I'm creating uh, breeds disrespect for those, and they those goals, and they become simply platitudes. And so it, it, it's incumbent upon all of us to, um, to walk the talk, and not simply just talk about wellness, but actually um, live it. But here is the most important component uh, of organizational wellness, uh, in my opinion. And that is to, to create and foster a culture in which we all look after each other. A and that is so much easier said than done because uh, creating a culture is kind of an, an amorphous thing. Um, and uh, cultures exist either by design or by default and usually by a combination of the two. But if we want to really pay careful attention to having a culture in which we each look after each other, and uh, uh, I look after uh, the employees that uh, I run into every day, and we all look after the students that we run into each day, and we don't pass a student who looks troubled without checking in with them and asking him, how are you doing, and is there any way that I can help you? Uh, the, uh, that, that that culture, creating and maintaining and supporting that culture, I think is the most important component of organizational uh, wellness. And, and it's not achieved in one year of focusing on wellness. It's not achieved by a series of workshops on wellness. They help, but I think it's achieved, like all relationships, day after day, 
based upon uh, not clever phrases, not gimmicks, but our, our very genuine commitment to each other uh, and to those around us. That's my own take on organizational wellness. All right, so we're just going to move into the next speaker here in the order, in the uh, interest of, of saving some time. So um, I would like to invite uh, Scott Calvin um, on up here, and he's going to talk to us about campus wellness. And what's that? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to speak on uh, campus wellness, building wellness. Um, we are building new buildings. Well, we just finished this one. Um, we try to incorporate as much green technology as we can, uh, HVA system controls, uh, computerized controls to make the climate um, more pleasant for students, faculty, and staff. Um, we we're also able to um, provide maybe cooler situations in some, warmer in others, such as Edom, where they might need a little different uh, atmospheres, and maybe the, uh, the, the parrots, some might be different than, than the, uh, the snakes and stuff like that, where they need more heat. Um, we're also looking into um, uh, doing, um, God, no, I'm sorry, pardon me, oh no, <laughs> let me get my notes, sorry, I don't this one open. okay, oh. okay, we're also um, in a phase of changing out LED lights, um, we do a little bit in, interior wise, um, we're doing a lot exterior wise, uh, more efficient, um, much, much lighter, brighter, easier to see when you're walking at night. Um, um, we also try to keep the rooms painted, uh, comfortable, uh, looking nice for students um, and staff members. Um, we've also are, are incorporating cyber keys where uh, basically uh, we can limit the access to certain areas at certain times um, for st faculty and staff. Um, and, and even some of our people, where they're not supposed to be in certain places, we don't allow them, and vice versa. Um, and um, stuff like that. I'm also talking about grounds. Right now, we're, on a, uh, we're trying to conserve water um, by still maintaining uh, healthy plant life um, and then being aesthetically pleasing to the eye. Um, Steve's done a great job, our ground supervisor. Um, try to pick up the trash, trying to make sure his, uh, walkways are clean. Um, a lot of times uh, we have problems with uh, roots going underneath the uh, asphalt and, uh, and concrete areas. Uh, we try to maintain those. Sometimes we replace them, cut out the root. Sometimes we'll grind them so there's, we have less uh, trip, trip hazards. Um, we also have a problem with uh, trying to uh, make sure their uh, ants and rodents um, don't affect uh, our, our performances at work. Um, so we routinely spray and we try to do the, the most economic way, way we can. Um, and also, um, a lot of conditions for athletics. Um, even though we're in a drought season, we do need to keep things prepped properly so people don't get injured. So there is some watering needed. Um, um, and that's about it, I guess. Are you a custodian? Uh, Eric Lopez will do the custodial. I'll just say it now, we play a role in the wellness too, the custodial department by keeping your classrooms, the buildings clean to cut down on the effect the clean classroom has, it cuts down on illnesses by staff, by students. We disinfect your restrooms, we disinfect tabletops, desktops. Uh, we do green cleaning, everything that we use here on campus from our toilet paper to our hand towels to Trash liners, it's all green products. Uh, of course, disinfectant is not a green product that's intended to kill any bacteria that causes illnesses or you know, sicknesses. But other than that, the glass cleaner we use from um, floor cleaner, just general cleaning, it's all green products. So uh, we're, we're pretty green here at Moore Park College. We've taken the initiative and the lead in the district and probably in the county too from from what I can see as far as being at a green cleaning level. Uh, so that, that's the role we play. Our staff play a role. You know, they, they, uh, they engage with students. They, they're helpful. I think all staff in the maintenance department from uh, the trades to the, to the grounds to the custodial, 
Um, we try to be customer service friendly, you know, part of that organizational wellness uh, Mr. Sanchez was talking about, you know, we, we, we direct students if asked, if, you know, we try to be polite and answer the questions as best we can. And, and, you know, we're here to serve the students and staff. That's what we do to try to keep everything in a positive, clean environment and, and assist when needed. That's, that's our role. That's the role we play. That's my take and I think Scott's take. So thank you. So you're seeing a theme here of how we have different departments, different staff members that are still ultimately committed to the success of our students. Success isn't just about grades, it's about being well as a human being. It's about being strong physically, mentally, emotionally, and we're all working together for that goal. The faculty you interact with a lot, the other staff members, though, take a moment to appreciate them. Take a moment to appreciate our custodial staff and our maintenance staff. Take a moment to appreciate our administrative staff. These are people who work hard for your success. And this is part of that answer to the question I gave you earlier. How can you contribute to the wellness of your campus? If you can make someone else's day a little bit better, you make your own day a little bit better. And it's a what they call a virtuous cycle, right? So let me have our, uh, invite our, our last speaker down and uh, then we will have our, our, our Q&A session. So I'm going to hand it on over to... How do you pronounce that last name? Manicus, okay. <laughs> Sharon uh, Manicus, who's going to speak to us about individual wellness and some of the other resources we have available on the campus. been sitting for a long time so um, but we're going to get on to striving for wellness it's personal and we're going to talk about that component for a little bit and I'm going to kind of stand behind here so I can put my notes down so what does your own personal journey towards wellness look like and that's what we're going to explore in this next part here do you focus on perfect ideals and do you miss the good enough moments in the day-to-day -day moments of life do you see distorted views when you look in the mirror? What are you seeing? Are you seeing imperfections of yourself and you're constantly beating yourself up? When you look at others, do you see the models? Do you see the perfect, pretty people? Do you see the people that have everything together? The ones that are in the perfect marriages? Well, I'm here to tell you, we all wear masks. We don't know what's behind those masks that all of us wear. and. Um, Behind those, they're just individuals. They're just like you and me, and we need to remember that. There are different domains of health. These are some of them. Occupational, emotional, spiritual, environmental, financial, physical, social, intellectual, wellness. They're all related. They're all interrelated. But emotional wellness is the important part of our overall wellness, and that's where I'm gonna go here today. In the next few slides, I want you to think about this question. How do you optimize emotional wellness in these areas of your life? Your relationships, your relationships on campus and our community, your personal relationships, academics, whether you're an instructor, whether or not you're a student in the classroom, your workloads, students are working, employees are working, how, do, how, do you, how does your emotional wellness fall into, do I exercise, do I eat healthy? And am I someone who has an illness, whether it's a physical illness or emotional illness that I'm working with, how does my emotional well-being play into that? So emotional wellness encourages us in self-care to learn to do relaxation, stress reduction, and develop our inner strength. We need to pay attention to both the positive and the negative feelings that we have and understand how to manage these emotions and acceptance of how I'm feeling during that time. To learn and grow from our experiences. To be independent or aut autonomy, develop that. Decision-making skills, proper decision-making skills that help us through our emotional growth and allowing us to express our feelings without any constraints. 
think about how wonderful it would be to enjoy emotional expression with one another and to be capable of forming those supportive and interdependent relationships with other people. So, what does this journey to emotional wellness require? Practice, practice, practice. Doesn't come easy. It's something that we need to do daily and work on. Being optimistic. We went through hard times, as President Sanchez had talked about, and it's difficult to be optimistic during that time. But optimism allows us to greet all of our emotions, both the positive and the negative, with an attitude of confidence and allows us to learn from those times or mistakes maybe that we encountered. To smile. I think one of the, um, I'm going to challenge you all, this is my challenge to you, is that every day, not to the people that you know do you smile, but to the people that you do not know, you smile too. And what you're going to find is that it changes who you are inside and it changes that day, that moment for that individual and can make a very big difference. We need to learn to ask um, for help and accept that help and support from others. We need to help other people. Being thankful daily, looking for those things in our life daily that we are thankful for and, and that gratitude there. Being mindful. How many of you know that we have mindfulness classes? Should be 100%, everybody. They are, and we offer them two days a week. It is a great way to learn how to be present in, um, in your moment, and it will help you in your classroom and success in learning. So, and to be focused. How many of you, when you sit there, I know for me sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about all the things I have to do. I've missed what was presented or what was said. And we get caught in that. And it learns to take us and bring us right back to where we need to be. We all make mistakes. That's what learning's about. I think some of the, the best learnings come from the mistakes. When I do something right, I don't think there's any room to improve. But if I make a mistake, there's always a place to go. And that's to learn and go forward. We need to balance all the dimensions of wellness and work on those as well. I don't know if you can see this really well. I think it's a bunch of um, dogs with different hats. But remember, you're all uniquely and wonderfully made. Your path on wellness and emotional wellness is your own. Wellness is an active process of becoming aware of and making choices toward a healthy and fulfilling life. Your composition of wellness will continually change, but start writing it now. By achieving optimal wellness, you will decrease stress, which we know is the number one academic impediment, reduce the risk of illness, and ensure positive relationships. We're a community here. We're in relationships whether or not we want to be or not, because this is the adventure of where we're at. And there are wonderful relationships out there to be made between people you work with and students you meet. And everyone has something to offer. So I go back to that question I asked you. What is the state of your emotional wellness when it comes to relationships that you have, relationships with your professors, relationships with your coworkers, your intimate relationships? Are they healthy? Are there things that you need to work on? In your academics, do you take course loads that you're doing that are 12, 15, 18 units when really you need to maybe be taking six units and working on that because you're working on other parts of your um, wellness? Do you exercise? What's your framework regarding that? Okay, am I optimistic about it? Nutrition, it's fuel for the body. And if you're struggling, with a mental health condition, which we know occurs in this population. How are you approaching that? And are you reaching out and getting assistance and acceptance? So that's it. So our key concepts here to think about community, composition, process. All of these are components of wellness. Components of wellness are stuff for us as individuals, but also as part of a community. So I'd like now, um, 
so we, we have a good amount of time here for some, some Q&A afterwards. So now I'm inviting you to consider some of these questions that I was asking you earlier. Uh, I was asking you, well, how do you think you can contribute to the wellness of the campus? And, uh, you know, uh, we were asking you some other questions about wellness, about your relationship with wellness, about your relationship with the community on the campus. So now I would, you know, like to invite you as the participants, as the audience, if you have questions or comments, something you would like to share with us uh, regarding any of the topics that we've been talking about today. Yes? Can we get the mic over there? Sure, there, yeah, thank you. Hello, my name is Bridget, and I recently joined the Student Voice, which is the campus newspaper here, and I would like to say I contribute to the campus and just saying I love getting news out and everything I can for the students and the campus and just covering any events that I can. I'm the social media editor, so I'm huh? always looking for something to post on Twitter, Facebook. I want to make sure that Moore Park is covered in all aspects, and I'm <laughs> very excited to be here. That's great, and do you find that contributing to the campus in this way, is this having an effect on your classroom work as well? Um, it is, but it isn't. Uh, I'm very good with time management, and so I make sure that I dedicate time to everything. And so if I know I have an article to write, I know I'll set time for that. If I have a test for a different class, I make sure I set at least a week or two in advance. I mm -hmm. uh, can procrastinate, but I'm very good with it. I've, <laughs> as I've become a college student, my studying techniques has changed dramatically, and I've known my my um, education here has not been wasted, and I'm very happy to just be taking every single class that I can just for my human being and growing as an adult. That's great. Thank you very much. And that, that concept of time management, as Sharon was, was alluding to, that's extremely important to wellness in terms of reducing our stress, in terms of prioritizing, things like that. That's very good. Um, and then just this concept of being engaged with your community, being engaged in the campus, whether we're talking about academics or extracurriculars, those are all really helpful tools and really helpful ways to think about your, your experience as either as a student or as a staff member or faculty. Very good, thank you very much. You. Any other questions or comments, ideas? Yes, up there in the back. Well, we gotta, we gotta wait to get the uh, mic to you. <laughs> Uh, since we started planning this event and we met for the first time, Sharon Manikas mentioned something that stayed with me till right now. She mentioned the concept of being sick and well. Mm. And I keep on thinking about that, you know, and I have so many examples of situations where people are sick and they destroy their families, their neighborhoods, their environments and uh, quite opposite examples where people are sick but well. And uh, I just wanted to ask Sharon if I'm on the right track in understanding your concept and if there's anything you can add. I think um, as we go through life invariably we are going to have illness and it's how we embrace and we work with that and our attitude towards life through that. So you can have cancer you can have a mental health um, disorder and still sit on the side of health, uh, wellness, of reaching out, getting the help that you need. But it's also your frame of reference and your attitude of which you go forward, right? I think that's a valid point. If we're talking about somebody who can be well physically but have emotional needs, and is not seeking the help, it's not seeking the support. That person you know, needs someone to reach out to them. That person can hopefully make healthy decisions for him or herself. But part of being a community is us recognizing some people need help, sometimes we need to intervene as staff members, as faculty, or even just as, as fellow students. Yes? So a thing that I've noticed after what going through, as each stage of this progressed, I actually have expressed some of these things like transition objects 
uh, the first time I went to a job, um, I took something with me, which was every day I'd walked into my work and greeted everybody by name, asked how they were doing, like I would do in high school. Mm -hmm. I thought people sort of got annoyed with that in high school, but I enjoyed it and I was more than happy and more than optimistic. And everybody at my workplace, I mean, because then uh, President Sanchez mentioned uh, moral value at, at work the morale was higher. In fact, I got promoted for it because I do walk, my, my manager literally said that because I walk in every day, greet every person, I got promoted for it. But I'm more than happy to see them with, with or without the promotion. I'm just great, I'm just glad to be at work. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of wa wa walked with me through life. In fact, I still do it right now at uh, my second job because I quit the other one because I, um, w I couldn't work two jobs at once, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but yeah, I took it with me to this job and it's just a nicer environment. That's great. Thank you very much. And I don't know, Matt, if you want to speak to that, that concept of transition and, and behavior, um, or if you had another comment. To <laughs> so one of the questions I had was, you know, or there was asked, oh, stand up. One of the, what, one of the questions that was asked um, was, does a transition object have to be a physical object or non-physical? And tying back to athletics, there was, it, it, there's a book, Malcolm Gladwell, and I don't, I think it's David and Goliath. Um, the, the book that we did on campus was Outliers, and my hunch is David and Goliath and Outliers are making the same point. I haven't read Outliers yet. But um, in David and Goliath, he talks about football players, and it was Harvard's football team in particular. And so Ivy League schools will recruit, um, it's been a while since I read it, so I'm spitballing on this. Ivy League schools will recruit, um, for their athletics, the, the students who are maybe like lower performing, like a C student or something like that. Because to get what you have at an Ivy League school is a bunch of students who are used to getting straight A's. And so if they get a B, they're like, my life is over. But if you have a group of students who have something else to identify with in life, so they don't find value in their grades, they find value in their, their teamwork, um, that's the move that Harvard's making with their football team is you can bring students who are C students in bring them on to something where they find value in other aspects of life. So if they don't get an A in, um, in one of their classes, they still get to say, you know what, I have value in my life in other places, and so the sport is carrying me through. In doing this uh, research on the transition object, I think actually what's maybe, well, at least also going on, is that with a team, that is a transition object itself. So it's leaving the non-tangible here. That, you know, one thing I know I can rely on as I've gone from, say, if you started sports at middle school to high school, all the process of a team, you know that process inside and out. You know that when I make this play, this person's gonna be here doing this. And so in a sense, that team becomes the transition object to carry you through. And that seemed to be what I heard from your move is that that, uh, that uh, routine was the transition object carrying you from one aspect of life to another. And so I thought I, I, that does seem really fitting. I, I agree with that. Thank you. I, speaking of you know character in sports, this reminds me of the story of uh, uh, Peyton Manning. You know, I was listening to a interview with Tony Dungy, who was his his coach and the, and the Colts. And Tony Dungy was talking about when it came time for recruiting and and hiring a new quarterback, it really did come down to Peyton Manning and another player. And the other player actually had better stats in college, was statistically a better player. But they also, for Tony Dungy, uh, as a coach, character was extremely important. And he actually sends guys to the schools to talk to the staff members. You know, how did he interact with the coaches? How did he interact with the maintenance people? How did he interact with the custodial staff? And Peyton Manning is a genuinely nice person. Or if he's if he's faking, he He's always faking, so is he faking? I don't know. But in any case, that's what really pushed him over the top was that not just was he a, a, a very high level athlete, let's not overlook that, but also he was making a positive contribution to the emotional wellness of the community around him, not just the people who had something directly to, to give him. So I, that's obviously had long-term beneficial uh, effect on his life, and I think it could for all of us, whether we're professional athletes or not. Great. Was any other comments or questions? Yes. This is for Matthew. <laughs> um, are transitional objects a bad thing, or can they be a bad thing? Because I've been told, like, you know, you, you brought up the your son and the blank, your child and the blanket idea, and I was told growing up, like, oh, I need to let go of that. Um, so yeah, I just wanted. To know about that. So formally for Winnicott, the transitional object is, um, I think, performing an essential function, and it's a necessary function. And then from a site, I do philosophy, not psychology, so I'm really dabbling in a place I shouldn't be. But um, 
uh, there's, when you go into kind of maladaptive behaviors, it has to do with relations to transition objects or failures to relate with transition objects, and that goes on later in life. But the, from Winnicott's perspective, the transitional object is, a, is an essential thing, and it's something that is needed. Um, and then, uh, so all this to say, in a sense, I guess, the way I had seen it in, um, in going through this was the transitional objects, like take a, a set of crutches. Crutches are a great thing. You've got a broken leg. They help you go from a broken leg to a healed leg, and they're essential. But when we say, oh, that's a crutch, we tend to say that in a negative connotation. And I almost think that's kind of on Sharon's point of, um, you know, what is wellness? Does wellness have to look like this ideal thing? A lot of times wellness is getting you through life. Um, and so if you need that transition object to still function for you, then it's performing a, a, an essential need. I think from the, from the psychological standpoint, one of the goals, uh, one, of the, one of the goals is, you know, if you have behaviors that are um, helping you adapt with situations, then it's helping you adapt with situations. The, the moment when a move happens, or needs to happen, is when that behavior is no longer helping you adapt to the situation. And then the psychologist stand, or the therapist standpoint is to help you to kind of readjust and find new um, mechanisms. But again, I'm not psychology, so I'll defer to whatever a psychologist says. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Could I just? Oh. Oh. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. I almost psychologist. No, well, what you said, I was thinking about this idea of good enough, you know, attunement, good enough objects, and good enough wellness. Um, and I think it's a really key point. And I was also thinking about my own sort of transition because I moved here from the Midwest for this. I'm a, a postdoc in the health service here. Um, and my shelves are lined with books. And these books have followed me around, and they serve as a transitional object for me in the sense that, like, I do have this fantasy of unlimited gratification, f like, an unlimited knowledge, and I'm going to be a perfect therapist or a perfect psychologist, and these books are, like, the object that kind of fulfills that fantasy. Um, and they serve an important function. They also, like, bring me a lot of pleasure, a lot <laughs> like, a lot of actual knowledge, too. Um, but for myself, I can get wound up in a place that does not feel well when I'm stuck on this idea that um, I'm not achieving um, perfect knowledge, perfect transmission of therapeutic goodness and that kind of thing. And so I think there's something really important, at least for me, about stepping back and saying, like, can I, can I do a good enough job? Um, can I approach wellness in an ongoing way in like small steps rather than thinking it's kind of this all or nothing switch? And I think that's, to me, that's a key feature of wellness. It's a moving towards, it's a process, um, and it requires self-compassion, I guess. Yeah. Great. Did you have something you wanted to add to that, Matt? Or are you? No? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that insight. That, that was great. Did you have a comment too? Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm still trying to formulate it, but the the idea that uh, we're 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 seeking wellness individually and organizationally. Um, obviously, w we want those things. Um, we also have competing goals, mm -hmm. uh, productivity, for example, um, and uh, sometimes it's competing, sometimes they line up really nicely. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I guess my question is, both organizationally and, and individually, um, I'm, I'm wondering if anyone would, would like to address um, how to integrate wellness among a, a, a wider variety of goals. Um, <laughs> oh. Okay, <laughs> Matt's gonna jump on that one. I really wanted to be sure I asked permission on this one. <laughs> um, and so right now there's a lot of um, success and equity funds coming in from the state. And um, we just had a, a success and equity presentation come through. and. Um, one of the things they had discussed was um, students who benefit from equity programs tend to have um, the best uh, communication, they're most comfortable talking to people in maintenance and operations. Now, from a maintenance and operations standpoint, they have a job to do. 
and they have to make sure that they're doing that job. But if from a success and equity standpoint of the students, one of the things that um, we want to ensure is that a student who is more comfortable talking to somebody from maintenance and operations than a faculty member, why don't we create an environment where people from maintenance and operations, they have some extra funding so that they can set something like that up so that they have the time to spend talking to the students who really benefit from this program and how we set up. I mean, it seems to be that that's an issue of fiscally, can we afford it? And then two, if we can't afford it, how do we direct the funds so that we can set up a program like that where that happens? But I think that's an exact, I mean, now that money's coming in, maybe something like that could happen, but you go five years ago, that's something that fiscally, there's a limited supply of people who are cleaning these buildings and, and creating a beautiful environment. And so if they're talking to all these students, they can't get their jobs done and you know that's a problem. And so you know, it, it comes down to money, budget, and uh, creating more staff to do something that is, I think, an essential function. I asked pre permission over here. I should have asked permission over there before I, I did this discussion. But OK, here. I'd love to add to that. Oh, cool. Thank you, Matt. So um, it's a great question, John. Uh, and, be, uh, and it's one that we struggle with at an individual level always, right? If we, if we concentrated on our physical well-being all the time, we would be exercising and not working. But we have to balance our physical well-being with the need to earn a living, and and we have those we have those kinds of balanced decisions to make all the time organizationally as well. Um, we hope that we can do it with a, like enough humility and grace that it's not always about productivity. But we know that if we totally take our eye off productivity, that we're not going to end up serving anybody in in the long run. So it's a it's a much better question than any answer I could give you. I'd just like to briefly mention, um, I just had a, a, a talk about this a couple of weeks ago with, uh, with this, we had this, this on-course training um, on, on the campus for staff and faculty. And during that presentation, one idea that came up was they show this, this, this matrix in which we can imagine the tasks of our day. And so we can align our tasks along four criteria. There are important and not important, and urgent and not urgent. And so there's different, attributes for each one of them. But the misunderstanding is that you should balance everything. You should balance unimportant and not urgent with urgent and important and things like that, but that's not true. Instead, we have to recognize there are some things that are out of our control that we have to do. So these are uh, important and urgent, but they're also stress-inducing. But instead, we should spend most of our time focusing on what can we do that is important, that's goal-setting, but that isn't needed to do right now. And that's maybe one way of thinking about being mindful and just goal setting and just thinking about what am I doing here? So is my goal, is, and, and it's important to think about what's important, uh, may, uh, um, leisure time. Relaxing is important, so that's not, that, that's not a waste of time. But if that's the goal, my goal is to have some leisure time, enjoy that leisure time, be mindful of that leisure time, but then thinking about what's the next task, what's the next task. So and I think it's also important, and, and um, one of our, our participants earlier was talking about how walking into work with a positive attitude and a productive attitude can help everybody else as well. So yeah, I have to do my work, but if I can help make the office environment more welcoming and, and, and more fun to be around, at least it helps the work go by. We still got to do the same amount of work, but at least we can approach it with a more positive attitude. I, I don't have any one good answer, but these are just things that are kind of popping into my head as we're going, it's going through. But thank you for your question. Was there anything else? No? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I can see you kind of hesitating. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I remember when I was a student here, so I was a returning student, and uh, it was in the 90s. I, I call it working on my second life rather than returning because I had never been here e um, anyway. But there was something at Moorpark College that I think was probably cut from funds, and that was there was this this women's lounge. I heard there was this women's lounge. I'm like, how cool is that? Mm -hmm. So I went there, and it was there was nothing in particular, but it was just the idea of of a place where you could go and find people that had some similarities uh, with you, mm -hmm. and and student equity is is right on about that because in the classroom you're surrounded by you know, a lot of uh, young students, especially if you take the day courses. And so it, it was a nice idea that I think maybe some people would benefit. I know we're always struggling with where are we going to put this center or that center, but it was just a little classroom with books and stuff like that and, and uh, people of, of common uh, 
maybe realities that, that, that could share and create a support group. So that was nice. And then I have a question uh, for, for the people of uh, maintenance and and uh, number one, you guys do a terrific job because in the 90s, it wasn't very clean in some places. <laughs> and, I, and I'm still appreciating now coming back as a faculty, how clean the campus is, it's beautiful. And, and the move uh, towards f the future. I always wondered, considering green energy and um, kind of wellness, is there a consideration in, in putting like, um, uh, solar panels that would cover the cars on the parking lots and so we would be in the shade and wouldn't burn ourselves when we go back to our cars and pro produce energy. The district has made a, um, uh, a deal with a company and they're basically going to get put, we're going to put a, um, a building, let's say a building with batteries in it and it's going to store energy so peak their during peak periods of time, we don't have to go off the grid. We can use our own energy. We'll, we'll, we'll be cost savings to us. So that's the only one that I know of. Solar, um, I don't think they've considered. Well, I mean, I'm sure they have, but I have never been in the discussion. John would does most of that for us. yet, but I've asked John and our, thank you, Ryan, uh, jo John Sinutko, the, our Director of Facilities, and uh, Darlene Melby, our Acting Vice President of Business, I've asked them to look into those options. I'd very much like to see it happen. I don't know if it's economically feasible yet. Okay, so thank you, everyone. I think that about wraps us up. But I do want to invite you, remember on your handout, there's your, your index card. So if you did answer the questions I have at the bottom, um, at, on the exit, as you're leaving here on the bench, there's a box labeled exit cards. So if you could place them in there, that would be great to get us some, some feedback. There is a sign-up sheet over here if you want to prove that you are here for extra credit or professional development or whatever it is. And um, again, I, I invite you to consider this question of, how can you contribute to the wellness of our community here? Smiling to your classmates, asking your friends or acquaintances how they are, picking up some trash, all these kinds of things, little things that we can do. What can you do? Think about it, okay? Oh, one more, one more. <laughs> Dude, what he just said, if the one way you can contribute, because we want to serve you guys and provide the best, the you know clean, clean environment for you guys, if you see graffiti, if you see spills, night, day, if you call the custodial office, uh, my staff get here at 4 a.m., uh, go straight to my email, communicate with them, we'll get on it right away. So, you know, we want to we want to have a, a healthy learning environment for you guys with nothing offensive written. We've been getting a lot of graffiti, so anything you see like that, please report, spread the word, report to custodial office, and we'll take care of it because we're here to serve you. Thank you. And it's a beautiful campus. All right, thank you for everyone for making this a successful uh, event. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy your day.